The process for watching, editing, and imagining how I wanted to document Bud's life was a hard process. Editing his interview into a story took some time and a lot of thinking. What to put first? How should I describe this aspect of his life? How should the documentation end? were major questions I had to answer early on. The biggest part of the process was perfecting the editing and putting the final touches and details to ensure that everything was perfect. This difficult, time-consuming project was totally worth all the stress and time because I know it will be so beneficial to Bud and his family. I got to learn so much about Bud that sometimes I didn't even know where to begin or how to tell a story. He's not just some person on a screen, he's actually someone that I've gotten to know and care about. Bud means to me something more precious than he could possibly imagine. He's part of my high school career and part of my memory that will last forever and will never ever be forgotten. Thank you for letting me learn about you and your life and that means a lot. I chose Bud because I felt an instant connection and familiarity with Bud's aspect of being in the Navy. My papa and my father were both in the Navy, so I felt like I would like not only to honor Bud with his story, but my family as well. Bud Bremer grew up mainly in Belvedere, Illinois, where he went to high school. Uh, high school was uh, a little strange to me. I only got started in before we had to move somewhere else, and I never went back to high school after the first year. He started working at Rockford Products, a manufacturer company of cold form components. And I was... Uh, doing a job trimming caskets, casket hardware and stuff. And they, they took that property, that, that area away from a place in Belvedere. During World War II, Rockford Products supplied screws and bolts for aircrafts, trucks, and other military equipment. They profited from the wartime production demand and became one of the leading aircraft bolt fabricators in the nation. It was hard work, and it was something we had to do, I guess. Then, tragedy struck. On Sunday, December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese. The surprise air attack on Pearl Harbor killed over 2,000 people, and over 1,800 people were wounded. This horrific bombing was an act of war against the United States and one of the most devastating attacks ever on the U.S. home front. This attack angered the American people and the U.S. declared war to get justice for the lives that were lost. The U.S. had stayed relatively neutral until this home front attack, but now it was the time to strike back. Well, I was surprised that it was so much talked about uh, because it was, I guess it was on everybody's mind. I shouldn't have been surprised, but uh, we all knew it was coming, I think. When Pearl Harbor was bombed and the United States joined World War II by declaring war on Japan, Bud was prepared to serve his country. I knew it was coming, so I expected it, and I, I knew I had two brothers that already were in the service, and I knew I was going to be there soon, so it didn't surprise me any. Bud was drafted into the war where he made the decision not to follow in his brother's footsteps and go into the Navy. Uh, I, when I went in for my physical in Chicago, they run us through a whole bunch of things and they, they were talking about it and I, asking questions about it. And I said, well, I was told that I could possibly be in the Navy if I went down to see the right people in the, in the office up there called the Navy Preference List. 
So I got drafted went right into the Navy. Training for the war was a six to eight week camp where Bud was stationed at Camp Claiborne. Camp Claiborne was located in Rapids Parish, Louisiana, where new recruits like Bud went through basic training. Well, there was a lot of marching and everything on what they called a grinder. That was the, the, the lot that we all marched on. And we had uh, senior officers that were already in the service and they were training us. And, and it, was, it was quite an experience for someone who was only 17 years old. So I was only 17 at the time, but I turned 18 soon after that. There were a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of young people that were going into the service at the time. And it, uh, that kind of surprised me that there would be that many at one time going in. Adapting to the training camp took a lot of focus and determination, and doing well in the training camps not only required adapting to the new, stricter environment compared to civilian life, but also completing and participating in the demanding physical activities required by the United States Navy. This turned the recruits into great physical condition, a major quality in helping defend the United States. Well, I expected it because I'd seen different uh, photos and different movies with something like that showing, uh, uh, sh some showing on it. So I kind of expected some of what was going on, but uh, I didn't expect it would be so, so many people in, in a certain place at one time as a boot camp was. Well, you, you had to learn to swim and, and uh, not learn to swim, but you had to be able to swim. And uh, it was, uh, the water was, was salty. And even in boot camp, it was salty. They did it purposely, I guess, to adapt you to ocean life, I guess. And uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like swimming in salty water. <laughs> you didn't have to. You had to do it, and you realized you had to do it, so you adapted as well as you could. Adapting from civilian life to a training camp could be difficult because the troops were away from their families and had to adapt to a new way of life. Well, you either had to adapt or you would... You would be uh, practically sent to a brig or something like that. It wasn't really a, a brig, but it was a place where you you had to be in what they called advanced training. If you adapted well, you you uh, you were pretty well ready to to. Go, go in and take this uh, life as you knew you had to. After Bud completed training at Camp Claiborne, he immediately received his duties from the United States Navy officials. He learned he would be directly stationed on the Navy ship called the USS Honolulu. This was another obstacle that Bud and his fellow sailors had to overcome, but with the naval training, he was up to the challenge to adapt and to serve his country with pride. The USS Honolulu was a light cruiser that was stationed in Hawaii when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. The USS Honolulu survived the attack from the Japanese and only received minor injuries. But uh, we, we boarded the ship at uh, San Francisco or one of the, one of the big cities out there. 
and we went straight to to Honolulu, and that's where we boarded the main sh the ship, the USS Honolulu. Well, actually, I enjoyed the 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 first trip to Hawaii from uh, from uh, the West Coast. I don't remember just exactly what town we left at, but I, I enjoyed that part of it. It was nothing but water as far as you could see, but uh, I enjoyed it. I got along well with my superiors and it wasn't, wasn't hard for me to adapt to it. One of Bud's main jobs aboard the USS Honolulu was to be a deck scrubber. A deck scrubber is one who cleans the decks of the boat. Every morning you got up at about 5 o'clock and you, one of your first duties were a scrub brush and uh, something to scrub the deck down. And uh, it, had, it had to line up six, eight people in a row and scrub this deck. And then they had what they called a squeegee, which was like a, a rubber uh, on, a, on the end of a handle. And you had to wipe the, the water off of the deck after, you, after it was wet down and scrubbed. You had to wipe it off of there with a, uh, what they called a squeegee. And it, it was like a windshield wiper, <laughs> more or less, but it was larger naturally. So uh, some people didn't, didn't care for it at all. It didn't bother me a whole lot. But I, I knew I had to do it, so I adapted to that. Cleanliness was a main priority into getting everything done and provides a healthier environment for people to work. Without the deck scrubbers, the USS Honolulu would not be clean and ready to do its job. This was also done to stop corrosion of the salty water getting on board the USS Honolulu's deck and making the wood corroded and shrink, which would wreck the boat. Another job of Bud's was to serve food in the mess hall where all the other Navy comrades sat down to eat. First of all, I was on mess hall mostly. I was serving meals to, to the crew as they walked by the, the, hall, the hall mess hall where they picked up their food. And my, one of my first jobs was putting food on the plate. And if the guy didn't like it, it was too bad. <laughs> He got along with it as well as he could, I guess. Some of it wasn't too too good, but uh, we adapted to it. Bud's last job during his time on the USS Honolulu was to help load the guns in a time of need. He would be prepared to help load guns when the USS Honolulu was being attacked or they needed to be on the offensive and strike back at the Japanese. Yes, it was in a, what they called a turret, and that was where there were uh, three six-inch guns that uh, aimed out of, out of the turret, and you, the ammunition came up. Uh, it came up from down below. They stored all ammunition down below. And uh, the third deck was for the shells, shell deck. That was like the bullet of the, of the six inch gun. And uh, the, the ammunition, the powder was stored down on the lowest deck that they had. And it went into a, a hoist, it hoisted it up through to get it up to the guns in the turret. And my main job was was to load from the from the storage place where the 
where the store where the bullets and the shells were stored and uh, to get it into the hoist to hoist it up through the the middle of the ship to get it up to the turret which was on the main deck it wasn't easy the shells were like like uh, 80 80 pounds or so around there and and uh, powder was around 45 50 pounds it was all hard work the USS Honolulu was part of the Guadalcanal campaign battle of Tassafernoga surface striking in the Solomons and the battle of Leyte the battle of Leyte was an invasion by the United States and just as the USS Honolulu got close enough to help their fellow soldiers the USS Honolulu was hit by a torpedo on its port side, and then Bud had to step into action. Well, yeah, the first time I was scared. I was on the main deck. I was moving ammunition on a plank that they had to, to move it from one turret to another, we sustained a, a torpedo hit in the in the forward what they call the forward uh, storage area for food and and stuff like that. We we took a torpedo there from a from a plane. We were back near near uh, Honolulu not not right near that but so closer to it and this plane came over an island we couldn't see it even until it went over the top of the island and headed right straight toward us it had one torpedo anchored to the bottom of the ship and uh, they dropped it. We were taught to, uh, if you've seen one, seen a torpedo coming or something, you lay down on the deck to, so that the, if, if you were right near it, you were in real danger. But a lot of, a lot of the people on the ship did did get hurt though, but if you laid down on the main deck, it, you you didn't uh, take so much of a shock as if you were hit practically dead on with the torpedo. This type of damage caused the USS Honolulu to turn back to the United States to get repairs. It uh, blew a big hole. I think it was about probably oh probably a six foot pretty close to six foot in diameter right in the side of the ship and uh, they they had to patch it up as good as they could we went down clear down to the New Hebrides to get a a patch put on so that we could be able to go back into battle if we had to. And we didn't do too much since that in, in a, a battle like, uh, like it was before that. The USS Honolulu was around Australia when the Navy ship was notified about the end of the war. Germany finally surrendered after the suicide of Adolf Hitler and after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, the Japanese also surrendered. But since the soldiers were still at sea, they could not leave their duties. I was real glad that it was over, practically over. and. Uh... We all got on and wrote letters home without it being censored at that time when we found out it was over. 
we got back to the States as quick as possible, which wasn't too quick because where we were when we heard about it was clear down almost to Australia. I think we were in the New Hebrides, and that's down closer to Australia than it is to Hawaii. It's uh, much closer. It's down there near near Australia, and uh, I I was ready to to call it quits and get out of there as soon as I could. The men on board still had to work until the USS Honolulu was docked in Hawaii. They continued to paint, work for two or three more weeks until their arrival home. And uh, we just did our work and helped get it out of there as fast as we could. Where Bud claimed he did not partake in the celebrations for the win. Uh, no, I never took any part of that, and he had any part of that. Uh, there, we were deck people. We worked on the main deck, and uh, didn't didn't bother us any that we had to do these things. But uh, if you if, if you were sociable and everything, you got along good with everybody. The hardest part, I guess it was just knowing you had to be there and you had to do exactly as I was telling you, or, or you were punished for it some way or another. Best memories. Oh, I guess Making a lot of new friends, I mean, and we wrote letters back and forth even after we got home. And, and we, there aren't too many memories really left of it. I just had to adjust to civilian life, and that was pretty easy to do. I still got my uniform. <laughs> I wanted to thank you, Bud, for personally making my last year of high school really, really, really meaningful. Without you, I wouldn't even be in Vet Doc, and I really appreciate you sharing your story with me and letting me share it with the world. You've done a lot for your country, and you've done a lot for me, so by making this documentary, I hope I get to share your story with everybody you know. and the whole entire world if possible because you are really important and you're really important to me and I really appreciate it and I hope you enjoy this documentary.